Hi, I'm Ms. McIntosh, and today I'm going to take you through the history of Hamlet, Hamlet criticism and Hamlet performance in eight simple images. If that sounds impossible, partial and biased, that's because every production, every edition, every history of Hamlet that you'll see is impossible, partial and biased. And that's what makes it incredibly fascinating to approach for an exam like the one OCR sets. You're examined here in an essay, a very short essay on AO1, how well you write, but then AO5, the history of criticism. And what you need to keep in mind with Hamlet is that nothing is ever as it seems, as it was, or as it will be the next time it's put on. So let's start with Terry Eagleton's line there, every age constructs Shakespeare in its own image. And we'll think from the very first and earliest edition that we've got about how that works with Hamlet. Here we go, 1603. The earliest copy, the very first one printed, we call this Q1, Quarto 1. Uh, Quarto 2 was published in 1604. Then, of course, we've got the first folio, the big fancy edition. Um, the edition you look at in class will be different to other editions that people have in classes because there are multiple editions of Hamlet that come out in those first two decades and editors make a decision about what to include and they add the punctuation, they regularise the spelling. So the very text that you're holding is a construction and of course as a play um, every single time it's performed every single time someone speaks a line in the dialogue it changes its meaning depending on where the emphasis is who's playing it how they're embodied in space and time and also quite crucially in what's been cut Hamlet is almost never performed in its entirety because it would be four and a half hours long so what you'd think, if you're thinking, well, right, well, what's the most authentic Hamlet is, well, the earliest Hamlet must be the most authentic Hamlet. And that's where you'd be very, very wrong. The first Hamlet found, the, the last Hamlet found was the first Hamlet published. So 1603 is called the Bad Quarto. Wasn't found until 1823, as I've written here. You can see a man called Sir Henry Bunbury, um, found it in his manor house. Uh, and it staggered the world of 1823 because it was terrible. To be or not to be, aye, there's the point. To die, to sleep, is that all? Aye, all. Doesn't really sound like Hamlet in his most iconic line. Um, the explanation for this is that it's almost certainly an actor's copy. Um, so it's the actor's notes about the lines they're reading, about the lines, the other lines that are going on are printed in 1603. There's a much more standard edition of 1604. But what that points to immediately is that what we're reading on the page in our modern editorial edition of Hamlet is not necessarily what people were seeing in 1603, in 1604, or at any other point in history. Uh, Zachary Lesser here, who's a historian of this particular quarto, in his uncanny history of the Shakespearean text, points out that the entire textual history of Hamlet is haunted by bibliographic ghosts. What I really want you to understand by the end of this is that there is no set Hamlet inside the text or outside the text, that Hamlet is radically contingent, changes all the time, but establishes himself in certain tropes over the 400 year history of the play. 1607, um, one of the, the earliest uh, record we have of, of Shakespeare being performed abroad is uh, an East India Company ship called the Red Dragon, where a fairly recently discovered diary fragments of the commander show that Hamlet was performed twice and Richard II once. Um, I'm just gonna read Richard Richmond Barber's quotation there. Keeling's men happened to initiate the global export of the canon that eventually became an important tool in the cultural work of colonization. It's very important when we read Hamlet that we remember that it has become um, the iconic text of Shakespeare's body of work and that Shakespeare has become the iconic author who represents Englishness and Britishness um, abroad as well as domestically. And here we have it being tied up right in the birth of colonialism. 1741 I've gone to here because that's when the memorial statue of Shakespeare is erected in Poets' Corner. Um, you can read that text yourself in the, this presentation, obviously it will be attached. But in 1901, George Bernard Shaw came up with the term bardolatry to describe the quasi-religious worship of Shakespeare and his works that has become standard in global culture. But that very much happened in Britain by the middle of the 18th century. 
So he's not a desperately important author before that point. As you can see at the bottom of the slide there, there's comments on Hamlet from diaries and letters written around 1660. The tragedy is but an indifferent play, the lines but mean rubbish. Uh, John Evelyn, the old play has begun to discuss this refined age since his ma majesty being so long abroad. People in the second half of the 17th century did not think Shakespeare was all that. By the middle of the 18th century, he had become the emblematic representation of Englishness. Um, if we were in class, I'd ask you to put your hands up if you've ever been to Shakespeare's house in Stratford-upon-Avon. And some of you would, normally. And then I would tell you that no, you haven't, because the 18th century owner of that house tore it down because so many tourists kept coming to see it. Um, Shakespeare as an industry, as something that people wanted to go and consume with the emerging consumer tourist trade, was completely in play by the end of the 18th century. And that's where Hamlet starts taking a turn as well. So at the late 18th century, early 19th century, the Hamlet that we expect to see emerges, right? So at the beginning of the 19th century, Hamlet makes a great leap forward to becoming the Hamlet we expect to see on stage in 2021. I've got Sir Thomas Lawrence's picture there of um, the tragedian John Philip Kemble, big 18th century actor playing Hamlet. Um, he's what we expect Hamlet to look like. Right? I've given you a picture of David Tennant there doing the same thing. We expect him in black. We expect him to be holding a skull. We expect him to be skinny, which we'll discuss in a second. But Hamlet has coalesced into an expected representation by this point. He's always got a skull. He's always wearing black. He's always saying to be or not to be, and absolutely not the bad quarto version. Um, we expect him to be a physically and metaphorically slender man, tragically aware of philosophy and thought in a world of violence and brutality, and thus unable to take action, and which is called the weakness of will theory or the Schlegel Coleridge theory. I recommend you call that the German romanticists, uh, Goethe and Schlegel. Very, very into him. Um, William Hazlitt, writing slightly later in the Romantic period, says, It is we who are Hamlet. And that's one of those key moments of. of brief self-awareness in this discussion that we could tie back to the Terry Eagleton, every age constructs the Shakespeare, that it needs every age constructs Shakespeare in its own image. Um, Hamlet is a textual creation who is seen as emblematic of Englishness or of intellectualhood or of masculinity or of ourselves or of our, depending on the moment we're in, our sexuality, um, how we understand mental health to work, how we understand depression. Um, again, none of that's inside the text. All of that is read onto the text. So we have a Hamlet who's evolving in time and space, very, very attached to national identity and a variety of other constructions. Before Romantic Hamlet, no one worried about the problem of delay. There was no problem of delay. That was just the plot. But by 1801, we're understanding this as the story of a man who can't make up his mind, who can't make himself act. One of the interesting things about Hamlet criticism is once you have a predominant reading like that, it's almost impossible to be innocent of that reading, right? It's almost impossible to step back and try and read Hamlet as if delay isn't an issue, as if we don't understand that as the central problem of the play. Uh, Freud's reading is just as strong. Once you have been exposed to the idea that Hamlet is far too interested in Gertrude's sexuality versus his father's murder. It's impossible to unsee that. That becomes a really embedded part of the experience of Hamlet. So again, always the dichotomy between the Hamlet who's textually evident, the Hamlet you can prove from language analysis, and the Hamlet who exists in culture, in performance, in history. This is my favorite thing, and this is the line I always come to, and it's a very contentious line. We've got a history of it here. Throughout the 19th century, we have the Fat Hamlet Wars. So in the entire German um, romantic tradition, as I've got Elena Levy Navarro's um, comments here, attributed to Goethe, developed by the German Shakespearean tradition, Hamlet's supposed weakness of character ex is explained by his fat character. Um, and in response, we've got this kind of like nuclear war of English-speaking Shakespearean critics developing enormous amounts of scholarly, scholarly methods, um, word level histories, bibliographic criticism to prove that when Shakespeare said fat, he didn't mean fat. Because the shape of Hamlet's body has become an enormously, ridiculously important thing because of the evolution of the importance of Hamlet in our understanding of Shakespeare. And Shakespeare has become enormously important in our understanding of Britishness, right? And um, I've pointed to two um, productions here. 
that were played by, um, you know, chubby Hamlets, Hamlets who weren't skinny. So we went to see the Benedict Cumberbatch production, um, and he's rake then, of course. You'll have seen bits of the David Tennant, also incredibly skinny. But Rory Kinnear in 2020, um, he's he's not he's not a skinny Hamlet. And then Simon Russ Simon Russell Beale, that what's talked about overwhelmingly in the reviews is that he's not tall and he's not slender. So the body of Hamlet, even though that's not textually evident, has become and remains enormously important throughout the 19th and 20th century. Um, in the Benedict Cumberbatch version, because all my students were trained to listen out for that, he's fat and scant of breath line. They just changed the word. They don't even say it. So it's this problem that's a really useful problem because it points to the way that every Hamlet that's created and constructed on stage can be contradicted by a part of textual Hamlet and that Hamlet is always changed in production. Right? It's, it's always assembled and created in the image required. And now what's happened to Ophelia is really interesting. One of the main reasons why people thought that Hamlet was a tacky, awful, embarrassing play in the late 17th and early 18th century was because of the sexual explicitness, um, especially that of Ophelia. That Ophelia is not the innocent victim to those up to late 17th century, early 18th century eyes that they need her to be. So most of her lines are cut for a good 120 years. Her entire madness scene is cut, and incidentally, so is Claudius's monologue, which is interesting. If he never says, oh, my offense is rank and smells to heaven and has his own speech, how does the audience ever know that he actually did it, right? That changes the play. But to leave out Ophelia seems particularly crucial. Um, this picture of Ophelia here is from the late 19th century. It's um, created by one of the most famous actresses of the age, Sarah Bernhardt, um, and this is herself as Ophelia with, of course, one of her breasts completely exposed. Ophelia sheds her clothes throughout the 19th century. Um, I've got a little quote there from 1698 to show you what Ophelia, censored Ophelia, why Ophelia was censored. Since he was resolved to drown the lady like a kitten, he's talking about Shakespeare, he should have set her swimming a little sooner. To keep her alive, only to sully her reputation and discover the rankness of her breath was very cruel. So her descent into madness, her quoting of all of those sexually explicit songs, and then her suicide is seen as deep sexual impurity, and it's all cut out. And then as Elaine Showalter has tracked um, in a fairly classic reading, as the 19th century, in, in ways that we've looked at in the Gothic and also in Ibsen and Rossetti, in the 19th century, we have this development of particular theories of highly female madness, specifically hysteria, coming from the root word there meaning womb, um, that is completely indexed to young, um, picturesque, out of control women who are shown in semi-clad um, pictures that, that very closely mirror Ophelia. And as, um, as, as Elaine Shevelter quotes here, every mental physician of moderately extensive experience must have seen many Ophelias. Images and stage photographs of Ophelia-like mad women taken in asylums and hospitals anticipated the fascination with the erotic trance of the hysteric, which would be studied by Charcot and his student, your friend, my friend, Sigmund Freud, right? So Victoria and Ophelia, a young girl passionately and visibly driven to picture of madness, just becomes the way Ophelia is presented. But that's a 19th century Ophelia. She's eroticized and she's presented in a particular way of performing madness, really from the late 19th century onwards. Um, as you'll have experienced if you've done one of those exercises where boys in the class acted Ophelia instead, um, she doesn't have to be read that way. The lines don't necessarily support that at all, right? Um, but the history of interpretation and performance, the culture surrounding it, shapes the way we see Ophelia. Wonderful line there. Um, there is no true Ophelia for whom feminist criticism must unambiguously speak, but perhaps only a cubist Ophelia of multiple perspectives, more than the sum of all her parts. And I would say that that's true of Hamlet as well. And our history of Hamlet is so layered, the, the representations of Hamlet are so stuck and yet invisible within the text. They don't exist in the text, but they exist outside the text. And we get very, very hard to get away from them and see the text in any kind of pure sense. It's the most written about play in the English language. It's the part that every actor wants to play as the crowning achievement of their career. It's, it's, you can't come to Hamlet innocent, right? Uh, another big turn in Hamlet criticism 
1900, 1950, you'll still see psychoanalytic readings now, Hamlet on the couch. Now that picture there, um, that's a crucial performance that, that if you're gonna learn some history of performance, you really should quote. Uh, Laurence Olivier's Hamlet from 1948. Um, the, he has an inserted opening line. It's Laurence Olivier's William Shakespeare's Hamlet, which shows you how ownership of Hamlet really is important. And he says at the beginning, this is the story of a man who could not make up his mind. So inserted hamartia there. Is it even valid to talk about hamartia in Shakespearean criticism of tragedy? Well, no, not necessarily. Much better argument for them being Senecan tragedies than Aristotelian tragedies. But this is the reading now, that, that there is delay. So we recognize that from romantic Hamlet, that it's because he is tortured in his mind and has a weakness of will in the Schlegel Coleridge thing. And that, you know, that is the nature of the play. Right? So you can see how we got there across 250 years. Um, love this quotation from uh, these, these two, Bynum and, and Neve, who summarize the history of psychological readings in Hamlet on the Couch. Hamlet is a kind of touchstone by which to measure changing opinion, psychiatric and otherwise, about madness. So as understanding of madness has shifted from 1603 up until the present, so has Hamlet shifted in criticism. Um, and also Hamlet is used, Ophelia is used, to inform the development of psychiatry in the late 19th century. So it's a sort of closed loop of self-referential systems. So what is the psychiatry of the early 20th century? Well, of course, again, your friend, my friend, Sigmund Freud, he says Hamlet is rooted in the same soil as Oedipus Rex, right? So the Oedipal complex is Hamlet in the early 20th century. That's really picked up by Ernest Jones, who's very, very literal about it. And Ernest Jones consults with Laurence Olivier um, and the creation of that production. So Ernest Jones's Hamlet and Ophelia, this Olivier production, you know, Hamlet on the couch, that's your early 20th century stuff. The other um, feature that Olivier incorporates here is he uses voiceover instead of soliloquy on many occasions. So it becomes an internal monologue, um, an idea of a conflicted mind, which is a representation of thought and madness instead of soliloquy. Yeah. And then finally, um, there's an enormous explosion of places we could go. Elaine Showalter points to, obviously, the emergence of feminist criticism in the academy in the 1970s and 80s. Um, some of these are just three things I've given you in reference to here. Hader, which we looked at, um, will have looked at in class, is 2014. It's not so much a, a straight production of Hamlet as it is a, a remake set in Kashmir. Um, and then Hamlet in Palestine, which is a documentary made in 2017. All of those are links. You can follow them. Um, is about a touring company of um, Shakespearean actors and directors working in um, the occupied Palestinian territories with actors there. Now, when you put Hader or Hamlet in Palestine, when you bring Hamlet, um, Hamlet to those two situations, it radically changes the nature of the text, right? So instead of it being a play um, about the psychological growth of uh, the complex romantic modern man who is deeply interior and individual in a world of emergent nationalism, like in William Hazlitt's It Is We Who Are Hamlet, suddenly it becomes a play about contested land. The, the fact that Denmark is potentially at war and then finally completely overrun by Norway um, becomes quite central to it. It becomes the most important thing to it. Hamlet there becomes the last man, the last potential leader, in, in a nation which is about to be colonized. Um, so again, really nice for thinking about how Hamlet changes radically. And also if we think back to the Red Dragon ship, back back in 1607, um, that Hamlet has always been part of colonization too. The teaching of Shakespeare, the teaching of Hamlet, um, quite famously built into the 19th century colonial efforts in India, um, the construction of English studies departments in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in India. So learning Shakespeare, learning Hamlet, performing Hamlet has served a colonizing function, um, performing Hamlet and learning Hamlet has performed an anti-colonial function. Um, Hamlet is whatever you want it to be. Uh, Maxine Peake there, I've mentioned that particular production. Women have been playing Hamlet since the late 18th century. Lots of records of that. Maxine Peake, just because you can go and look at reviews of that, they completely gender swap the cast. So she's a female Hamlet. It's worth looking at that and seeing what that does to the play 
by changing the nature of the bodies on the stage. Um, and I've put there as a line, one of those iconic lines from the play that we tend to use a lot in interpretation, Denmark is a prison. What do we mean by prison? When we put it in this context, we could be saying gender is a prison, sexuality is a prison, um, colonization is a prison, or the mind is a prison, family is a prison. The thing with Hamlet, again, is that there are infinite possible readings. And what I would like you, because it's my thing, to do all the time when you're experiencing one of these interpretations is think about what's being left out. Think about what's not being said. How is Hamlet changing in response to performance, um, staging, space and place in which it's happening, and the actor's body who's fulfilling that role and speaking those lines? And uh, yeah, fascinating, overwhelming, little bit uh, difficult, but um, but fundamentally incredibly worth it.